Charles Finney was born in 1792 in Connecticut, but lived most of his childhood in Oneida County, New York. His parents were not Christians. Finney grew up largely ignorant of Christian doctrine. He remembered no preaching of a gospel witness in that part of New York, which he called a wilderness, though the historical records indicate there was at least one strong evangelical church in the community. The religion Finney remembered as a child was, he said later, quote, of a type not at all calculated to arrest my attention, end quote. So, much like many modern Christians, at an early age, Finney developed a distaste for what he felt was dry doctrinal preaching. Unaware of the biblical truth found in 1 Corinthians 2.14, that the man without the Spirit cannot accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, Finney attributed his lack of interest to lack of creative, entertaining preaching. In fact, he described the only preacher he remembered from his youth in the following terms, quote, his reading was altogether unimpassioned and monotonous. And although the people attended very closely and reverentially to his reading, yet I must confess, it was, to me, not much like preaching, end quote. Finney characterized the pastor's content as, quote, a dry discussion of doctrine, end quote, and then added, quote, and this was really quite as good preaching as I had ever listened to in any one place. But anyone can judge whether such preaching was calculated to instruct or interest a young man who neither knew nor cared anything about religion, end quote. And so Finney's views that preaching must be entertaining and include much humor and many stories began to be forged, not from scripture, but from his own personal experiences. Again, doesn't that sound familiar to the modern church? Finney grew up largely ignorant of Christian doctrine. He developed a distaste for what he felt was dry doctrinal preaching. Why? Because he was unaware of the biblical truth that the man without the Spirit cannot accept the things that come from the Spirit of God. So instead of looking inward and saying, wait a minute, maybe there's something wrong here, he looked outward and said, well, the problem obviously is lack of interest in creative, entertaining preaching. Well, it goes on from there. Listen. Not long after, a mere two years later, Finney began to preach as a full-time pastor. It was, I believe, extremely unfortunate that Charles Finney chose to pursue a preaching ministry immediately after his conversion. Devoid of any solid Christian influence in his early life, he was almost completely ignorant of the scriptures and of theology. Finney had a brilliant mind, however, and had always been able to hold his own in a theological debate, even with a trained man like Pastor Gale. His legal training had conditioned Finney to think logically, but it had also saddled him with a world of wrong presuppositions. Finney's notions of justice, guilt, righteousness, transgression, forgiveness, responsibility, sovereignty, and a host of other terms were drawn from his legal studies, not from scripture. Again, amazingly like the modern church, men who are almost completely ignorant of the scriptures and of theology, but brilliant, smart, great communicators, excellent entertainers, out there preaching notions drawn not from scripture, but from other places. And again, it continues on. Worse yet, Finney denied that a holy God would impute people's sin to Christ or impute Christ's righteousness to believers. Finney concluded that those doctrines clearly taught in the third, fourth, and fifth chapters of Romans were theological fiction. In essence, he denied the core of evangelical theology. For the sake of time, I have cut out a ton of this history, but that important last line says it all. In essence, Finney denied the core of evangelical theology. That's how he was able to build his false evangelism. Again, listen to this. In short, Finney had removed God from the equation and replaced it with his own mix of personal experience, legal terms, and ideas, pragmatic, if it works, it must be good kind of thinking, and human logic reason. In fact, Finney was the first influential evangelist to suggest that the end justifies the means. He wrote, quote, the success of any measure designed to promote a revival of religion demonstrates its wisdom. When the blessing evidently follows the introduction of the measure itself, the proof is unanswerable that the measure is wise. It is profane to say that such a measure will do more harm than good. God knows about that. His object is to do the greatest amount of good possible." End quote. And with that human, very unbiblical logic, Finney introduced a movement in modern evangelism that is still affecting us today. Yeah, he sure did. 
I mean, did you catch that? That, that almost sounds so smart, so common sense, doesn't it, at first? You think to yourself, well, yeah, he, he's saying the success of any measure designed to promote a revival of religion demonstrates its wisdom. In other words, the end justifies the means. Look, the church is packed. We've got 10,000 people. They're falling out of the rafters. They come forward by the droves. It must be of God. That is the cry of the modern church. It makes so much sense. It, it seems to. And then he says, when the blessing evidently follows the introduction of the measure itself, the proof is unanswerable. What is causing these crowds and these decisions for Christ? It's this new way that we're preaching that discards God's way. It must be working. But the problem is, A, it doesn't line up with Scripture, and B, 10, 15, 20, 30 years later, the proof is in the pudding. The reality is, when people fall away, it's undeniable. And especially when you can match that with what Scripture has warned from the beginning. We need to learn from this. This is the last section. Listen. Finney's ministry was centered in western New York State. Even during Finney's lifetime, the area was known as the Burned Over District because repeated waves of religious fervor had seemed to erase any real concern for the gospel. But in his younger days, Finney always seemed to be able to fan the flames at least one more time. Before long, however, the excitement and fervor of the supposed revival gave way to hardened unbelief and widespread agnosticism. The burned over district was scorched again and became harder than ever. In fact, since Finney's time, that part of the country has never experienced another revival. In short, Charles Finney, the father of seeker-friendly altar calls, fabricated a man-made technique that, as Scripture said, had the form of godliness, but was without the power. In other words, he created a carnal way for carnal men to carnally and therefore falsely respond to a half-gospel and then not be converted at all. In the final analysis, it was a, a method of evangelism that had a huge amount of big upfront activity, but in the end, bore very little genuine fruit. And even worse is that it hardened literally millions of hearts to the true gospel. That's what he meant by it was the burnt over district. They, they started thinking, well, I've already heard this thing about Jesus Christ dying for my sins and nothing happened. I didn't change when I came to him, but they never really came to him. And that's the danger of it. So if it were to be asked, how did the modern approach to evangelism based on seeker friendliness and, and getting people to come forward and make decisions for Christ begin? Well, church history tells us it began with Charles Finney. And if it were to be asked, so how did Charles Finney's evangelistic approach work itself out in the big picture? How did it stand the test of time? What fruit did it bear? During 10 years, hundreds and perhaps thousands were annually reported to be converted on all hands. But now it is admitted, Finney's real converts are comparatively few. It is declared even by himself that the great body of them are a disgrace to religion. So it seems Finney's real legacy in the end was the disastrous impact that he had by introducing his evangelistic theology to an all too willing American church. And the American church in our generation is still reeling from the impact of Finney. Decisional regeneration is not how God converts the human soul. That is how carnal men and sometimes even well-meaning but severely misinformed Christians, pastors and preachers make for the most part false conversions. And just to confuse matters even more, God is pleased to genuinely save a small amount of true believers right in the middle of that chaos. Yes, even in the midst of inappropriate use of inappropriate means, God sovereignly and graciously sometimes, in some cases, very small amounts, takes and actually genuinely saves someone based on the tiny parts of the true gospel that are being presented in the hearts of people who have been prepared elsewhere by other means, which for some people, I suppose, creates the, the false impression, at least, that such evangelism has its place. But please, make no mistake, evangelism of that sort typically does much, much, much more harm than it does good. 
which is why as a church, we here at First Baptist of Boynton Beach need to learn from the mistakes of church history so that we don't end up repeating the same mistakes as Willow Creek did and as many others who have followed in those footsteps. And so to that end, I want to repeat the biblical position on this because I am often misquoted on this even when I explain it as I just did. People insist that therefore I am against altar calls. Well, here's the biblical position. Number one, altar calls in and of themselves are neutral. They are neither inherently good nor inherently bad. But as we said, we've got to be careful how we use them. In fact, number two, some godly preachers, though woefully few, but some have used altar calls effectively in their ministries, only they did so by being far more accurate and complete in their preaching than most who use altar calls today. In other words, they included the whole picture and then got involved with the altar call and had things before and after and during that were very different. But number three, altar calls, especially when the person using them is not clear on salvation theology themselves. In other words, like Finney, they're smart, they know some of the terms, but they did not study their Bibles, and so they don't know how God converts the human soul according to Scripture. They, such people as those, when they use altar calls, do have a built-in tendency to abuse them. And so in the modern church, they almost always are abused. Number four, the problem, the real biblical error with this type of evangelism it's not found in altar calls per se. That's not the problem. The problem is in the false doctrine of decisional regeneration. It is in the unbiblical teaching that implies or outright states that saying a prayer or walking an aisle at an altar call alone will save a person. So, of course, as soon as I say that, some people say, well, there you go. And so altar calls aren't the problem, so why not? If they're not the problem, use them and just use them right. Well, first of all, altar calls, I hope we have seen in these past nine weeks, are simply not necessary. I mean, I could, I could help be an instrument in the hands of God wearing a brown suit or a blue suit. I don't always have to wear a blue suit. And in the same way, I don't need to do an altar. It's, it's a side of the fact. That is not how God converts the human soul. The fact of the matter is, it is necessary for men to publicly confess Christ. But correct me if I'm wrong, but we've just seen from church history, and certainly you've seen it in experience, many people profess Christ publicly at an altar call who have never confessed him in their lives by living publicly, separated, godly lives for Christ. That's how you really confess Christ. It's not necessarily walking forward and announcing it in a crowd one time. So the bottom line is, even though altar calls are essentially neutral in and of themselves, these days they come with some very real and very disturbing dangers. And to close out this morning's sermon, let me give you six dangers to altar calls. I'll put them up on the screen. Here they are. Listen. Danger number one. Individuals can easily be led to believe that their trip down the aisle during an altar call is somehow equal to salvation. The public act of going forward can be so intimately associated with the genuine act of faith that confusion results. People begin to believe that they are saved by this act rather than by Christ. Danger number two, requiring a public act at the point of salvation can lead a person to think that they have done something to get salvation which compromises the doctrine of grace. Danger number three, altar calls can lead to an overemphasis on the public response or the public aspect of decisions, but a public decision for Christ is not always a reliable indicator of true conversion. In fact, usually it's quite the opposite. History has repeatedly shown that public decisions frequently prove to be quite unreliable as barometers of genuine conversions. And scripture itself teaches that the fruits of true conversion will only be evident in the life of a believer over time. Danger number four, 
altar calls can eclipse the real cause of conversion. The real cause is not the decision or the appeal or the walking of an aisle, nor the sinner's prayer, nor the felt emotion of the moment as emotional music is softly played in the background. True conversion is caused by the Holy Spirit who draws some to believe as the gospel is proclaimed. And that will happen whether or not an altar call is given. Let me repeat that. True conversion is caused by the Holy Spirit who draws some to believe as the gospel is proclaimed. And that will happen whether or not an altar call is given. Danger number five. Some churches think that they are evangelistic merely because they use altar calls. But in reality, many churches are lulled into an evangelistic passivity where their only attempts at evangelism as a church or as individuals are the altar calls at the end of each service, many of which are so deluded and unbiblical in their presentation of the whole gospel that they are consistently fruitless regardless of how many people come forward and appear to receive Christ. Danger number six. The historical record is indisputable. Altar calls have produced considerable mischief as the early Methodists predicted when altar calls were first introduced in the early 1800s. And early Methodists proved to be very correct in their initial judgment about that. Gospel presentations have grown increasingly diluted, much shorter and less complete. False conversions have become epidemic in the modern church and God's truth and way are being maligned as a result. And countless thousands have been and continue to be led into an emotional response without a clear understanding of just what they're doing. As a result, false conversions have abounded. You see your pastors on Sunday morning having altar calls. If they don't, shut your door, you hypocrite.